What's up everybody, I'm Calvin McClure, and if you've clicked on this video, you probably want to know how to build a better plane in KSP, or even build one altogether. Well, you've come to the right place, and today, I'm going to take you through all the basics and fundamental concepts you need to know to build not only a plane that flies great, but also one that looks pretty good too. Whether you're wanting to build the next plane for high-speed contracts, or a high-altitude flyer, or anything else in between, these essential design tips and tricks and basic fundamental concepts will help carry you to success. Once you get these down, and it's easier than you think, flying in KSP will never be the same again. In fact, some of these tips will even help you build better rockets and space probes. So without further ado, let's get started. In this tutorial, we're going to cover seven essential aircraft considerations you need to know, whatever kind of wing craft you're planning on building. Whether it's designed for orbit, high speed, low speed, high altitude, or low altitude, all of these principles or considerations will always apply in one way or another. How they will apply comes down to the type of aircraft you're wanting to make and what its mission will be. So here's a list of the seven essential considerations or principles you need to know. Number one is the law of moments. Number two, flight control surfaces and where to put them. Number three, aircraft weight and balance. Number four, aircraft flight dynamics. Number five, landing gear. Number six, wing shapes. And number seven, drag. In case you're not really interested in the theory side of things and you just want to get the design, I've gone ahead and created some timestamps for you in the video. So if you want to skip to one section or another or replay the one as much as you need, go right on ahead. So what is the law of moments anyways? Well, the answer is you actually probably already know. And if you don't, it's actually really easy to understand. Whether you realize it or not, you've already got a solid grip on what the law of moments is. Nevertheless, because this one is so important and affects so many aspects of your plane's design, let's take a bit of a deep dive into it. Honestly, of all the items on that list of seven essentials, this one is one of, if not the most important ones you need to know in my opinion. In fact, it's so important and prevalent just about everywhere, understanding this will even affect how you design your rockets and space probes. When I did my undergraduate engineering studies, the law of moments was one of the first things we learned. I swear, once you begin to understand how loads and forces are applied on objects, this thing is everywhere. So here's how we mathematically model the law of moments. It's expressed by the total or resulting bending moment is equal to the distance to the pivot, also known as the moment arm, times the applied force times sine theta. An even more simple expression is the distance from the pivot or moment arm times the perpendicular component of the applied force. Let's look at each of those individual items real quick. When you think of a bending moment, think torque. In fact, that's how bending moments are quantified in units of torque. In imperial units, we're usually talking foot pounds or inch pounds in smaller applications. In SI or metric units, Newton meters is what the unit of measure is. The difference between torque and a bending moment, though both have torque output units, is that torque is applied rotationally along the shaft, think wringing out a wet towel, whereas a bending moment applies a bending force, like bending a ruler. Okay, so why does any of this matter when designing an airplane? Well, in short, it matters a lot. Like just about everything about how you design an airplane is affected by this in one way or another. The most important part to remember about the law of moments is how the resulting bending moment is affected by the length of the moment arm. Now fair point, both the applied force and the distance are equally important in our mathematical formula. But of the two variables, the distance from the pivot and the applied force or the moment arm is the one that will more often than not be the dominant factor in how our design is affected. A great way to visualize the law of moments is a teeter-totter. If both kids sit at equal distance from the pivot and both are equally heavy, the teeter-totter will not move either up or down on either side. But if one of the kids moves further away from the center, the moment arm they're exerting is now greater 
and so is the resulting bending moment, and their side will go down. Conversely, if they move closer to the pivot, the moment arm will be smaller, and their side will go up. Similarly, if the two kids are sat at equal distance from the center, and one of them somehow gets heavier, the force they're applying will not be greater, and so will the resulting bending moment, so their side will go down. Another super quick and easy example is a ratchet. Need more torque? Get a longer handle. In fact, some ratchets are even designed with telescopic handles for this very reason. Alternatively, get someone stronger to push on the ratchet. So that's it. That, in all of its glory and simplicity, is the law of moments. As we progress through the rest of the list, you'll see how this comes back and applies again and again. Aircraft flight control surfaces are the movable surfaces or aerodynamic devices of an aircraft that adjust the aircraft's flight attitude, or to put it another way, causes the plane to move in either pitch, yaw, or roll during flight. The different types of flight control surfaces are ailerons, elevators, rudders, elevons, but also include slats and flaps, spoilers, ground spoilers, and multifunction spoilers. Ailerons are the control surfaces responsible for rolling the aircraft, also known as banking. These devices are always located at the tips of the wings of an aircraft, and we'll see why in a moment. Elevators are the control surfaces responsible for pitching the aircraft, that is, bringing the nose of the aircraft up or down, and are always located all the way at the rear of the aircraft. Again, we'll see why in a moment. Fun fact, elevons are devices that combine the functions of ailerons and elevators. Again, more on that later. The rudder, which is the only vertically mounted flight surface on an aircraft, is responsible for yaw. That is the left to right nose motion and is located in the vertical tail fin assembly at the rear of the aircraft. The assembly of the elevators and the rudder on an aircraft's tail is what's known as the empennage. Slats and flaps are what's known as high lift devices. Per the name, high lift devices are responsible for generating increased lift during the slower phases of flight, that is, takeoff and landing. Slats are located on the leading edge of the wing, whereas flaps are located on the trailing edge of the wing. Since the behavior of slats isn't really modeled in KSP, we won't get into it and there's really no good reason to. We'll just focus on flaps. In real life, the lift generated by a wing depends on three principal factors. The first is the shape of the wing, known as the airfoil. The second is the airstream velocity, or the speed of the air as it flows over and under the wing. And the third is the aircraft's pitch attitude or angle of attack. In the real world, the effective speed of the air as it pertains to wing lift depends not only on the actual speed of the aircraft, but also of the wind speed and wind direction as well. But in KSP, since wind isn't really a thing unless you've got a mod that changes that, only the aircraft's speed and angle of attack are responsible for the lift generated by the wings. What's important to know here is that the faster you go for the same wing at the same angle of attack, the more lift you generate, the slower, the less. Hence, during landing for instance, there will come a point where unless something more is done to compensate for the loss of lift generated by the wings that comes from simply moving through the air slowly, you will not be able to maintain altitude. Insufficient lift at a given airspeed leads to increased takeoff and landing speeds, neither of which are desirable. And that's where flaps come in. They perform their magic by dynamically changing the shape of the wing, thereby increasing total lift generated. A second function that flaps serve, albeit this one is really more of a consequential effect, is that they increase drag. There is a basic reality in physics that says, to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. This is known as Newton's third law. For our purposes here, what that means is in the case of flaps, work done on the air by the flaps to generate lift means work is done on the flaps by the air, or in layman's term, drag. Now normally, drag is not a desirable thing in an aircraft, but for flaps at least, during landing, drag is actually a good thing because it helps us bleed off that excess speed we need to get rid of in order to land nice and slow. In real world applications, as an airplane like an airliner performs its approach phase, you will gradually increase flap settings and with each setting, further increase the amount of deflection, lift, 
and drag. On the Airbus A220, which is the plane I work on, we have five possible slat flap configurations. In KSP, you have up to three. During takeoff, flaps are also very useful in helping us get to that point where we are generating enough lift to actually begin flying. But because here we're trying to increase our airspeed as well as our lift, we don't want to generate too much drag, which is why we use a lesser flap value than we do during approach and landing. Spoilers are some of the more interesting flight control surfaces on an aircraft. They actually come in three possible different types. Spoilers, multifunction spoilers, and ground spoilers. The simplest type, spoilers, also known as air brakes, are used to slow down the aircraft by producing an increase in drag over the wings. They achieve this by spoiling the flow of the air over the wing and creating a large low pressure area, which in turn creates a large amount of drag. But very often, spoilers will also be used to induce roll in an aircraft, hence the multi in multifunction spoilers because they serve multiple roles. Get it? Roles? Roles? Because they roll the aircraft? Anyways, as we were saying, multifunction spoilers can serve both the air brake and roll functions. Lastly, ground spoilers are dedicated landing spoilers and are used solely during, you guessed it, landing. During the touchdown phase of a landing, that is, when the main landing gear made contact with the tarmac, all spoilers will deploy to not only increase drag and help slow down the aircraft, but also to help settle the aircraft on the tarmac and keep it from bouncing. This is known as ground lift dump, and the deployment of all the spoilers is how this is achieved. You see, upon touchdown, we want to get rid of any lift, or as much of it as we can, when landing, because at that point in the process, lift actually becomes a problem. Once the gears make contact, you want them to remain in contact with the tarmac, and have the plane as a whole be as settled as the tarmac as possible. Remember, the flight part of the flight here is no longer what we're in for. Have you ever wondered why in so many aircraft, the fuel is stored in the wings? Yes, there are exceptions to this, wings that carry no fuel at all, and we call those dry wings. And yes, most large aircraft also have centerline tanks, but nevertheless, in most aircraft, most of the fuel will typically be carried in the wings. Now, there are two perfectly good reasons why engineers choose to do this. Number one, the space is there and available in large amounts actually, so why not use it? The second reason, and the more important of the two really, has to do with the center of mass shift of the aircraft. We'll come back to this a little later during the design phase of the tutorial, but for now what you need to know is that storing the fuel in the wings allows for a minimal longitudinal shift in the aircraft's center of mass as fuel is consumed. This is a very important metric in affecting how your plane flies throughout all of the flight phases. You see, one of the key concepts in the flight characteristics of an aircraft is the weight imbalance. Once in flight, all of the weight of the aircraft is scared by the wings, the big ones, not the little ones at the back. In fact, the empennage is solely there to bring pitch and yaw inputs and stability. Here's what I mean. In the same way that the sum of all the parts all combine together their respective weights into one single expression we like to call the center of mass, we can get an equivalent concept for the total lift generated by an aircraft called the center of lift. In the VAB or the space plane hangar, those are respectively the yellow and blue checkered balls. Now obviously in the real world, as is almost everything that's covered in this tutorial, it gets much more complicated. But in all honesty, this is a close approximation. During flight, the center of lift acts as a pivot. Remember that teeter-totter from earlier? Same thing. In pitch, the aircraft will tend to pitch nose up or nose down about this pivot, not the center of mass the center of lift. The empennage actually keeps it in a stable attitude via elevator inputs. In fact, in a stable configuration, which is what you'll find in the vast, vast majority of aircraft, the center of mass is always forwards of the center of lift, creating a certain nose-down tendency. The elevators, by producing a small pitch-up attitude, counterbalance this and combined that is, all of these forces acting together, the center of mass, the center of lift, and the elevator pitch inputs, the aircraft attains a stable attitude. But this balance will tend to shift ever so slightly during flight, due in part to fuel burn, which moves the center of mass. The way pilots account for this is to fine tune this balance in a procedure known as trimming the aircraft. Now this point leads us nicely into our next point of discussion. 
No doubt you've probably heard by now of terms like aerodynamically stable or relaxed stability. Essentially, these terms describe an aircraft's designed naturally stable position, or lack thereof, so to speak. An aircraft with built-in stability will, of itself, without pilot input, tend to return to a naturally stable position, whereas an aircraft designed around the relaxed stability profile is inherently unstable and will not tend to naturally return to a stable position. In fact, in this configuration, a relaxed stability profile will require continual inputs to prevent it from spiraling out of control. Interestingly, in KSP, you can actually achieve both of these types of profile, and how to achieve it is actually fairly simple, but more on that later. Now this topic is another one of those rather important ones, especially for high-speed aircraft. Drag on an aircraft is what's known as parasitic drag, and it comes in two forms, skin friction drag and form drag. Form drag is determined by the front-facing size of the object moving through the air, that is, its presented cross-section. The technical term for this is called orthographic projection. What that means for us here in KSP, in this context, is predominantly in terms of the wing thickness. This is an often overlooked item and why a lot of people struggle to make a fast-moving aircraft. Thick wings move a lot of air and so, in return, require a lot of power to push through that air. Thinning out the wings and increasing their strength multiplier to compensate will make for a much slimmer profile and a much faster aircraft top speed. Another very important topic of discussion for overall aircraft behavior is wing geometry. And there are two main topic points here. The first is anhedral versus dihedral, and then the second is aspect ratio. A very easy way to distinguish between anhedral or dihedral is as follows. An anhedral wing has its wing tip lower than the wing root, the mounting point of the wing, whereas with a dihedral wing, it's the other way around. The tip is lower than the root. For an upper fuselage mounted wing, also known as a high wing, anhedral is the way. As a set of examples, here's the C5, and then here's the AN224. For lower fuselage mounted wing, or low wing, dihedral is the way. As an example, here's the 747, 737, you get the point. The reason why we choose those two configurations in those respective settings is actually quite interesting. But here's a very important lesson you need to know. Dihedral increases roll stability, whereas with anhedral, it increases roll performance. So why then does a high mounted wing always have anhedral and a low mounted wing have dihedral? Let's look at the high mounted wing for the answer. Most KSP players actually already know the answer to this, believe it or not. Imagine a pendulum. Because the pivot, or the mounting point if you will, is higher than the center of mass, any roll will be naturally countered and the pendulum will return to dead center. In aircraft parlance, with a high wing design, insofar as the vertical plane is concerned, the center of lift is located higher than the center of mass, and that will tend to create a naturally stable aircraft in roll. So in order to help improve rolling performance, we give the wings a slight anhedral angle, and yes, this does work in KSP. In a low wing configuration, it's the opposite. The center of mass sits atop the center of lift, which tends to create an unstable roll configuration. So adding dihedral improves rolling stability. Another reason for dihedral with a low wing is it allows for additional ground clearance on a wing mounted engine configuration. Another key takeaway from all of this is, regardless if you have a high, mid, or low wing design, you can help improve rolling stability or performance simply by adding either anhedral or dihedral to the wings. The aspect ratio is a measure of how long and slender a wing is from tip to tip and is calculated by the square span divided by the wing area. What you need to know from this is a wing that has a high aspect ratio, think of a glider or the U2, will produce lots of lift with minimum drag. Another way to put it is it will have a high lift to drag ratio. A high aspect ratio produces a more stable aircraft, whereas a low aspect ratio tends to produce a more unstable design. We've not yet addressed landing gears, but we'll take care of that as we work through the design phase. But now that we've covered the basics, let's go to the interesting part and the reason why you've probably all clicked on this video in the first place.
This is my T38 Talon recreation I use in my series. Since I've already got it built, and because I think it looks pretty good, we'll use it as our design demonstrator for the rest of the tutorial. Without following any particular sequence of topics from the list we just covered, let's go through item per item and put it all together. I'll help you put the theory and the pieces together. So let's start with the wings. You might actually be surprised to hear this, but when comparing a modern airliner wing to something like a fighter jet wing, the airliner wing is actually a more complicated design. Fact of the matter is, they tend to have many more moving parts, hence the complexity. The main difference between the two is that one is optimized for subsonic speeds while any supersonic flying aircraft has to have an airfoil shape that is in keeping with transonic and supersonic or faster than sound speeds. Aerodynamics start to get pretty complicated once you enter into the transonic regime and compressibility starts becoming a thing. But fortunately for us, we don't need to get into that. For this tutorial, I've gone and built a single wing, very much like the kind you'd find on a real world counterpart. Most modern airliners will have wingtips known as winglets. These help reduce wingtip vortices, which in turn cause a reduction in drag. But with the way lift is modeled in Kerbal Space Program, winglets really don't do much of anything except being a purely aesthetic thing. Ailerons are the first of the major flight control surfaces we come to. Their purpose, as we discussed before, is to induce roll or banking on the aircraft during flight. Now recall from the law of moments, remember that first of the principles we covered at the beginning of the video? That the two components that make up the resulting effect, here that would be the actual rolling of the aircraft, depend on two things. The first is the magnitude of the applied force, and the second is the length of the moment arm. Here, the moment arm is the longitudinal perpendicular distance from the aircraft's center of mass to the aileron's center of lift. That's a bit of a mouthful, but here's what that looks like. The force component is the aerodynamic force produced as the aileron moves up or down into the airstream. Now if you recall from the law of moments, the longer the moment arm for a given force, the greater the resulting moment, or torque, or in this case, roll. And that is why ailerons are always, always placed at the far end of the wing, never inboards. It allows engineers to minimize the size of the ailerons, which in turn reduces their mass, as well as the mass of the hydraulic systems needed to actuate them in flight, since being a little smaller, they're easier to actuate. By placing them far away and increasing the moment arm, you are still able to maintain a high level of authority, even though the actual flight control surface itself remains small. Even in the case of a delta the wing. This still holds true. The moment arm and resulting moment are still greatest at the wing extremity, and so ailerons are still positioned at that same place. Outboards. So lesson number one is, ailerons go to the tips of the wings. Always. So how do you set them up then? Well, to get the movable surface part to function as an aileron, there's three things you need to do. Number one is to set the amount of deflection somewhere around 25 to 30 degrees is good. Number two is to set the strength multiplier value. Depending on what kind of aircraft you're making, this value will change. A high performance aircraft will induce more stress on the ailerons and so a higher value should be desired. But for most aircraft builds, anywhere between 0.8 to one should suffice. Lastly, set the roll value to 100 and set pitch and yaw to zero. If you're making an elevon, you would set both roll and pitch to 100. The strength multiplier, in case you're not aware, allows you to structurally make the component stronger so it won't tear off so easily. Increasing the strength though does come at a price, which is increased component weight, but sometimes you just don't have a choice. Some components require more strength to get the job done. The default strength multiplier value is always set to one, and depending on the aircraft or the component, you might need to increase or even decrease that value. More aggressive flying will require stronger surfaces, whereas with gentle flying, you can shave off a lot of weight by utilizing lower strength multiplier values. Gentle kinds of flying, like high altitude soaring or gliding, simply doesn't require the same strength as high performance does. The good news about flaps is they're a pretty straightforward item. In real life, you actually have several different kinds of flap designs, but in KSP, we really only have one kind. 
what's known as the plane flap. As we mentioned before, flaps are located at the trailing edge of the wing. So this is where you're going to put them as well. Laterally, the common practice is to position them starting inboard and working your way outwards from the fuselage. There's really no good reason to place them further outwards on the wings. Flaps move symmetrically up and down on both sides of the aircraft as you don't want them to impart any rolling motion. In fact, in reality, a flaps miscompare would trigger a caution alarm to pilots were it to occur. Moreover, because of the bending moment they induce on the wing structure, it just makes it easier to mount them inboards rather than outboards on the wing. If the flaps were located further outboards, the moment arm would increase, and so too with the resulting bending moment in turn increasing the loads and the stresses on the wing. And so far as size is concerned, a larger surface area means more lift, but also more drag. How big comes down to the type of craft you're making and the kind of landing you want to be able to perform. While there are general principles to follow, there is no right and wrong answer. You'll have to test flight your design and fine tune accordingly. So how do you set them up? To get the movable surfaces part to function as a flap, three things you need to do. Number one is to set the amount of deflection. Somewhere around 60 degrees should be good. This is the value that the flap will take at full deflection, that is, at deflection number three. Number two is to set the strength multiplier. Since flaps endure a higher amount of stress, anywhere between 1.2 to 1.5 should be pretty good. Again, this will be application dependent. Number three is to select the flap option right here. This will tell the game what function this part is supposed to perform. Lastly, set the up and down or on off function to an action group so that you can move the flaps as needed in flight. As any design feature in a vehicle, flight testing here is going to be key in getting it just right. The amount of deflection, the size of the flap, and so on. So there's one important key note here in using flaps that you should be aware of. If you weren't using flaps before in your designs, when coming in for landing, be careful with the throttle value you have. Too low a setting may lead you to getting caught out by the increase in drag. Not that I would have anything to know about that. Anyways, moving on. Multifunction spoilers, ground spoilers, and just plain old spoilers are one of the more interesting wing components in my opinion, and depending on what type of craft you're aiming for, you can really have some fun with these in the design phase. Now the most basic implementation for these is simply air or speed brakes. Spoilers. And so far as where you place them, there's really almost no wrong answer here. For example, here's where the spoilers are located on the Talon, here's the F-16, here's the F-18, F-14, F-16, here's the shuttle, and on most airliners and cargo planes, they're right there on the wing's upper surface. Here's the A380, here's the A330, here's the C5. Anyways, you get the point. So how do we set up the spoilers? Well, to get the movable parts to function as an air brake, here's what you need to do. Number one, again, set the amount of deflection. There's really no good or bad answer here. Obviously, the higher the deflection, the greater the drag. Somewhere between 45 to 60, 30 degrees, anywhere there should be pretty good. Number two is to set the strength multiplier. I would suggest around two because spoilers are high drag devices, so they will encounter higher amounts of stress, especially at high speeds. Thirdly is to select the spoiler option right next to where the flap option is uh, located. Lastly, just like we did with the flaps, bind these to an action group. Normally, by default, they're already bound to the brake action group, so I would suggest to just leave it like that. Another thing you could do with spoilers is to bind them to a particular action group that could, say, deploy a parachute, cut the engines, and deploy the spoilers all at once. You know, for when you just absolutely have to stop. Now, with regards to using spoilers as multifunction spoilers, you can add some amount of roll value to them, which will definitely look cool in flight. But since you can't limit the amount of motion to only an upwards movement or a strictly downwards movement, you're going to want to limit the amount of roll value you dial in, else you're going to see the spoilers clipping through the lower surface of the wing. If you want to incorporate roll trim, you can actually use the flap feature, turn the flap upside down, and it'll deploy upwards. And there you go. Alternatively, you can incorporate roll trim into the ailerons themselves with the flap feature by simply having either the left or the right aileron moving up or down, whichever you prefer. And then you bind those to an action group for left or right trim. 
Moving to the rear of the aircraft now, we come to the elevators. The general rule of thumb here is to place them almost as far as you can towards the rear of the aircraft. As we've previously discussed, the reason is simply that we want to have the largest moment arm between the location of the elevators and the aircraft's center of mass and center of lift. Having the elevators placed further aft from the center of mass will increase their effectiveness or their authority in pitching the nose of the aircraft up or down. When your flight surfaces have greater authority, the smaller they can be and as a result, they weigh less and generate less drag when they're used. In a delta wing, such as what we find on the shuttle or the typhoon or the mirage, for example, the ailerons are actually called ailevons in that they perform the function of both the roll and pitch axis. In high performance aircraft, such as with a jet fighter, you can also even include some roll authority in your elevators to further improve rolling performance. For aerodynamic reasons that are not modeled in KSP, supersonic aircraft have to incorporate a fully movable tailpiece, whereas subsonic aircraft really only need an elevator tab, which is the actual moving part of the tail for pitch, and it is mounted onto what's called the stabilizer. Although one of the reasons for having such a large flight surface is increased performance in all flight regimes, really the main reason why supersonic aircraft have fully movable tailpieces is actually shockwave mitigation and supersonic airflow management. In KSP, however, having a fully movable tailpiece really only comes down to improved performance and even just plain old aesthetics. The rudder, as was mentioned before, is the sole vertically mounted aerodynamic surface you find on an aircraft. Whereas every other winged portion of an aircraft come in pairs for the vast majority of aircraft, both big and small, save with some fighter aircraft, the rudder stands alone. For the same reason as we've already discussed with the horizontal stabilizer and elevators with respect to their positioning on the aircraft, the rudder is also mounted at the rear of the aircraft, as this helps improve its effectiveness in providing yaw inputs. To get the control surface to function as a rudder, you need to 1. Set the amount of deflection, somewhere around 20 to 25 degrees should just about do it. Number 2. Set the strength multiplier to around 0.8 to 1. And lastly, set the yaw value to 100 with pitch and roll set to 0. And that's all there is to it. The process of setting up a design that incorporates dual rudders is exactly the same. We've already touched on this in the theory section, but your wing design, if incorporating a wet wing, should minimize a longitudinal center of mass shift as fuel is consumed. In other words, the wet center of mass and the dry center of mass should be located as close as possible to one another. Regardless of whether or not you use a wet wing or a dry wing configuration for that matter, minimizing center of mass shift is key to maintaining good flight performance throughout all flight regimes. You don't need to have zero center of mass shift, but the more you minimize it, the better. If you really want to push the envelope and get fancy, you can even incorporate a multi-stage fuel tank design where you assign different fuel consumption priorities to each sub-tank. In this way, you could, say, have the smaller, further away tank consume its fuel before the bigger, closer one does. But in all of this, whatever configuration you use, whether a purely wet wing design, combination of centerline tanks and wing tanks, wing tip tanks, or only centerline tanks, you're going to want to be sure you minimize center of mass shift. The easiest way to confirm this is to compare the wet center of mass to the dry center of mass. You probably already know, but in case you didn't, the wet center of mass is the yellow checkered ball, whereas the dry center of mass is the red checkered ball. The more the two overlap, the better. Again, some shift is acceptable and might not even be avoidable, but the less, the better. Here, we come to one of the most impactful metrics on how your plane is actually going to behave. At this point, you should have a wing design that's pretty close to being finished. What I mean is the shape, the thickness, and the location of the flight control surfaces have pretty much been established. So too for the wing itself. The reason why this matters for this next step is that all of those components combined will affect the actual final center of lift's location. One last thing that should also be a given at this point is what kind of aircraft you're making. That is, are you making a straight line fast X-plane, a cargo plane, a high altitude flyer, a glider, 
And why does that matter? Well, it matters because the answer to that question will determine what kind of relationship the center of lift will have to the center of mass. The golden rules to observe here are as follows. For a stable aircraft, the center of mass should be located forwards of the center of lift, but don't overdo it though. For a stable but more responsive aircraft, the center of mass is still forwards of the center of lift, but closer. For a maneuverable aircraft like a fighter, the center of mass should actually be really close to the center of lift or right on top and maybe even aft of it. So the general rule of thumb is exactly this. Moving the center of mass further forwards of the center of lift will increase the aircraft's ability, whereas moving it closer to the center of lift increases aircraft responsiveness. So when should we use which? Well, for RP-1 contracts, there are two kinds of aircraft. There's the super fast X-planes, and then there's the high altitude flyers. For fast, straight line speeds, you should really be looking at option number one. For high flyers like a U-2 type, option number two is best. Having a stable, but not too stable design will allow you to make the most out of the available lift your aircraft can produce. Take a look at all these aircraft pictures. What do you notice about the main landing gear? Well, if you look carefully, they're all located very near to and just slightly behind the wings. Why? Well, for one last time, remember the law of moments. When we spoke of the elevators, we mentioned how we want them placed as far aft as possible because in that case, the length of the moment arm is determined by the distance between the elevators and the aircraft's center of lift, and we want to maximize that distance in order to maximize pitch performance. But here, with the main landing gear, the two points that will determine the length of the moment arm are the center of mass and the point of contact between the main landing gear and the ground, with the pivot point being that patch of contact with the main gear. Our objective here is to have an aircraft that, upon takeoff, is easy to rotate, that is, to pitch the nose up to soar off into the skies once we're moving fast enough. In order to achieve that, our moment arm needs to be short. Why? Well, if you look at the forces acting on the aircraft during the rotating phase, we have two bending moments acting on the aircraft. The first is the elevators trying to pitch the nose of the aircraft up, and the second is the bending moment produced by the center of mass, and it is producing a pitch down bending moment. So as you can probably see, the plane will rotate easily if the first bending moment is large and the second bending moment is small because it will be easy for the first bending moment to counteract it. The mistake I've seen so many people make over the years is placing the main landing gears too far behind the center of mass of the aircraft, which results in a large moment arm and a large center of mass bending moment that's hard for the elevators to overcome. So the lesson here is that the location of the main landing gear should be placed close to and aft of the center of mass, but not so close and not so far either, too far and the plane will have a hard time rotating and taking off. Too close, and you might end up, well, nose high when you really shouldn't be. One final note for the main landing gear, don't place them so close together either, or your aircraft will tend to be really easy to tip over. Try placing them as wide as you can. It will make for a much more stable aircraft upon landing, especially if it's a fast one. As for the nose landing gear, its placement is somewhat less critical. Basic rule of thumb is, place it on the center line and as close to the nose of the aircraft as possible. Further forwards will help improve the straight line stability of the aircraft, which is a good thing. Okay, so now that we've covered where to place your landing gear, there's one more metric that I've seen often overlooked, but has a big impact on how well your plane is going to land. And that is the spring and damper stiffness levels. You can adjust both of these in KSP, and it's actually more important than you might think. Look at these videos here and notice how much compression you see happening. This is actually pretty close to what you want to achieve in your design. You see, one of the most important jobs or functions the landing gears on an aircraft have to do is to absorb in a controlled manner all of that sudden influx of energy when the plane hits the tarmac on landing. Now ideally, you want a smooth landing with as little impact as possible, but that won't always be the case. And when it's not the case, the last thing you want is to hit the tarmac and then bounce off of it. No, what you want in a case like that is for the gears to do their job and to take as much of the hit as possible, thereby allowing the aircraft to remain on the tarmac with little to no bouncing. Just look at the difference here between these two drop tests. 
both of these aircraft are being dropped from a height of 5 meters, which is a pretty good drop. But notice how much more settled the one on the right is. That's what you're aiming for, because that configuration can absorb and dissipate that potential energy well. So there you have it. These are all the fundamentals you need to know in building an aircraft. The hard part, as is the case in real-world engineering, is that very, very, very often, the different possible options that are available to us tend to conflict and to compete with one another. And one of the hardest parts of engineering and producing the best design is figuring out where the optimal point of conflicting design choices coincide to produce the best result. A good design is very often the result of the best compromises. Knowing where that hollow ground lays, I'm afraid, takes practice and repetition. There's just no two ways about it. As always, keep in mind that whatever you're building, design is an iterative process. Start off with your best initial assumptions as best as you can. Make your first design, prototype number one, and then test, refine, and repeat until satisfied. If you feel like it's over your head, here's a quick list of what we've covered, as well as some quick tips you can mix and match to get a good design. Number one, ailerons go at the wing extremities. Number two, elevators go as far aft as reasonable. Number three, flaps are symmetric, located on the trailing edge, and are very useful for helping improve takeoff and landing performance. Number four, main landing gear are located close to and slightly aft of the aircraft center of mass. Number five, need a stable aircraft, high mounted wings, dihedral, center of mass, ahead of the center of lift. Need a fast aircraft, low form drag, stubby and thin wings, stable aero profile. Need high maneuverability, anhedral, low mounted wings, relaxed stability, large flight control surfaces. Need a high flying aircraft, high aspect ratio, as close to zero center of mass shift, and a not too stable aero profile. Need to slow down? Spoilers, drag chutes. And number 10, use atmospheric autopilot. You'll thank me later. Well, we've reached the end. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial and found it helpful. As always, please leave a like and feel free to share your thoughts and comments down below in the comment section. Check out the Patreon page if you'd like to help the channel out and come hang out on the Discord. I'm Calvin McClure and I'll see you next time.